Rachel and Phil. We see Stephanie and Locum. We've got Rhonda, Carolyn. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody. I am going to keep monitoring the waiting room and letting people in while I am talking to you. As you can see, we're all here. Um, we've got Terry and Ronnie here with us today, and they are going to talk to you guys, of course, about um, their books. And we're all very excited to have them here. Hold on. I'm admitting people while I'm talking to you. Um, so welcome and thank you for um, being a part of this wacky new landscape of virtual author events that we are all trying to figure out all together at once. Um, I'm Carrie. I work for Anderson's Bookshop for their events team. And, um, you know, it's just been a really wild ride over the last few months. Uh, for those of you that don't know or have never been with us before, Anderson's has actually been in business selling um, independent books since 1875. So we have survived other pandemics, specifically the 1918 one that everyone keeps talking about, and we will survive this, but it's been a little rough. And um, my point in sharing that is just that uh, we are so grateful for your participation today and for your purchase of the books through us. It makes a real difference to real people um, every single time that you guys support us in this method. So we are so grateful that you're here because your support of us being able to present these types of events to you lets us continue to bring you high quality content like this. So we are, um, when we say thank you, I know those of you that come to other Anderson's events know that I always stand up there and say how grateful I am, but I really, really mean it, especially right now. It's a rough time for us and um, we just are incredibly grateful to have you guys here. Um, that said, here's how the format is going to work today. I know it's a little different than our regular events. We are going to let uh, Ronnie and Terry speak for about half an hour. Um, you guys are welcome to ask questions through the chat, and I will be monitoring some of those questions that we can ask um, afterwards uh, when they're done presenting. And um, so just keep them coming, it's fine. I will be placing links in the chat pretty regularly for both of their books so that you guys can order their books through us if you'd like. We do ship anywhere in the country. Um, or you, if you're local, you're welcome to come pick it up in our stores, we love to see you. So uh, let's see, with that, I think I've covered all the main points and I am gonna step out and let you guys come for what, or enjoy what you came for. Hold on, I'm still admitting people. Um, I want to welcome Ronnie jo Joseph <laughs> Lovovsky um, with his new book, The Primal Gourmet, in conversation with Terry Turner, um, who, of course, we all know from her book, No Crumbs Left. Um, I'm going to let you guys take it. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Ronnie, this is so exciting. This is so wonderful. I'm so excited to be here in Chicago with you. I looked back on our messages and it was like, Sort of, I think right after you got started was one of the first messages I ever sent. And, and when I was just sort of discovering this kind of eating and invited you to be um, on the Whole30 feed over at the Feed Feed. So this yes. is, you know, we've known each other more than a minute. And I am so, so excited about your book. And it's doing pretty well, I understand. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, first of all, thank you, Terry, for joining me. Uh, I know you're a busy gal. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be with me, celebrating the book and for all of your support, not just now, but over the years. You've been incredibly supportive and I'm very, very grateful for it. And to everybody that's watching and tuning in, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, you know, we would have loved to do this in person. That was really the, the goal two years ago when we started the book, but nobody plans to publish a book during a global pandemic. And you know, you gotta pivot and you gotta, you know, the world was a different place. Uh, a couple months ago. So this was really, in one way, it was kind of, okay, how do we still celebrate the book with the community, the people who have been here for years supporting me um, and, and have been supporting the book, and also how to support local business, because that's really one of the parts of a book tour is heading to local towns and supporting local businesses. So I have to say a huge thank you to Anderson's um, for hosting us today, even though it's virtually all of the books that are sold today. If you haven't already purchased a copy, please do so through Anderson's. You'll get a signed copy of the book. We sent over some signed book plates there. Um, so please, if you have a chance, Anderson's is going to keep sharing some links in the 
um, in the chat group where you can purchase uh, directly from them. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, we're going to do a recipe today, right, Terry? We're going to do the faux touche from the book together. Yeah, and one thing I just want to say is it's easy to, you know, click on and just order it at Amazon, but the reality is small business where it's at. It's the heart of our community. It's the heart of our world. And if we don't support small and local, they won't exist. So uh, if you're going to get a book today and have it, absolutely get it through Amazon. How do we get started, Ronnie? Okay, so... Uh, if, if you want to cook with us at home, this was kind of a last minute decision Terry and I made. Originally, we were just going to, you know, chat and have a conversation over a drink for coffee or some spin drift or something like that. And then we decided, you know what, let's cook something. It'll be really easy. We can do a salad from the book. So we picked the fotouche. This is one of my favorite salads because it's super simple. It's got a lot of flavor. There's some fresh herbs in there and a really bright vinaigrette. So if you're not familiar with Fatouche, which is a Middle Eastern salad. It's basically a garden salad with uh, fresh herbs, vegetables, lettuce, tomatoes, onions. Uh, but what they do is they put in some fried flatbread or pita bread, and that gets kind of like a crouton, and that gets soaked up by all the wonderful, delicious um, uh, dressing and juices. We're going to just skip that, and it's going to keep things Whole30 compliant, paleo. Um, but if you're not, you know, if you're living your food freedom right now or, or later on when you make the recipe, you should definitely try it with some fried flatbread or maybe some croutons that you have laying around. So we're going to start by making... Feta would be lovely also, I just want to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you want to put in some feta uh, or even some halloumi cheese, that would be really great. We're going to start by making the vinaigrette because that way, by the time our salad is ready and prepped, the vinaigrette will have a chance to kind of like the flavors will get to know each other. So I like to do everything in a, in a mason jar. Terry, you're gonna do it in your, in your marinated onions bowl, is that the one? That is exactly right. All right, so you can do it either way. Start with some extra virgin olive oil. And you know, I, I, I eyeball it. I think it calls for a quarter cup. That looks pretty good. Quarter cup, extra virgin olive oil. Then we got, what do we got here? Let's do juice of half a lemon. I got to read the ingredients. You know, I, there's, a, there's 123 recipes in the book. I can't memorize them all at the same time. So I totally get it. And everyone thinks we have all of our recipes memorized. It's like we absolutely do not. I mean, I have my marinated <laughs> onion memorized and my uh, heroin chicken. But the reality is we got to look in the book. And it's fun to look at it and sort of rediscover what we did. Yeah, it's fantastic, right? So I got juice of half a lemon going in. And then this, you know, any kind of scraps I'm putting in a little bowl here on the counter just to catch them. So I can just pop those in the compost later on. So juice of half a lemon. And if you have any questions, like, like Carrie mentioned at the beginning, Zach is, uh, Zach is on Terry's end and he's going to be monitoring. So if you have any specific ones for the recipe, you can shoot them in there and then he'll see if, uh, if any are, you know, relevant to the recipe, we can call them out. Otherwise we'll be having a question answer period at the end. So what's yes, the that's right. red wine vinegar? So we got some red wine vinegar going in about a tablespoon. Okay. Wine's pouring really slow. That's good. Generally, I don't know how you are with dressing. I know you make a lot of your own dressings at home, Terry. I like, I like it really tangy, like really bright and vinegary. So I usually go like two parts oil, one part vinegar. Sometimes I'll go three parts oil, one part vinegar. What's your take on this? How do you I usually go with like that? I would say three parts, you know, oil, probably, you know, one part vinegar, but sometimes it's, it's really half a sour, and then, you know, half a vinegar, so uh, half an oil. So it might be like oil, but it might be vinegar and lemon or something. But I do like things bright. I like hangy. Yeah. I absolutely love, you know, I think that's part of like having the heat, but also having that vinegary, that sour. Yeah. And the thing is, like, I think a lot of people, when they make vinaigrettes at home, they're tasting it just as is. And it can be really punchy. But you got to remember, it's going to be going on all of these vegetables and it's going to get 
it's going to start release some of the salt is going to start releasing the liquid in the vegetables. So it's going to like, it's going to get diluted a little bit. So I think if you're going to make dressings at home, just be mindful of that when you're tasting it on its own. It's, it, it's okay if it's a little bright and acidic at the beginning. One of the things I like about your cooking, and I, and I think mine is the same, is there's a lot of you're really encouraging people to get in there and try. You know, it's like, it's not always measuring the salt. It's like becoming aware of and learning how to salt, you know, so that we aren't married to this exact recipe, but we can go, yeah. oh, okay, this is what goes in it. And I, and I noticed that in the book, you say half 11 rather than two tablespoons or something. Anyway, I like yeah. that really encouraging people to cook from their own intuition and learn it. We've got to own yeah. our own kitchens. You know, my publisher, we share the same publisher. That's Our publisher gave me a little bit of pushback on that. They wanted things, you know, really precise. But I said, you know, there's a time and place for precision. Right. And there's a time and place for jazz. You know, you got to, you know, vinaigrettes are the kind of thing where you got to you got to play jazz music. You got to improvise a little bit because not all things are the same. Not every vinegar is the same kind of tanginess or has the same kind of acidity. Not every, every lemon is the same size. Not every garlic clove is the same size. So when, when I write recipes, and I think it's kind of similar to, to your approach, it's very much hands-on. Get a feel for things, and then you can go from there. Absolutely. I love that. And since we did have the same publisher, I'm like, I am stunned that Justin let him do this. Cause I, <laughs> but I think I, I think I paved the way for you. I want you to know. You, you broke both, down many doors, fun. Terry. <laughs> but I think I paved the way. Yeah, you said. broke down many doors over the many doors over there. So I've got some freshly chopped garlic. I just chop it really, really fine. You can use a garlic press if you like. You can mash it. You can grate it with a fine microplane if you like. I just did a fine chop. That goes in the dressing. Next, we've got a teaspoon of ground sumac. So this is, you know, what's funny, Terry, is the past couple events that we did for the virtual tour. Um, people keep asking me about sumac, and I know you, you're you a big lover of sumac, right? You use it all the time, right? It's regular for me. I mean, it's, it's my, in my everyday cooking, and it provides that wonderful lemony, you know, yes. sour, I, it, it, on eggs, on meat. It's, it's, it's an everyday spice for me. Yeah, I love it. And so if anyone is wondering about sumac, which is a very common question, you'll find it a couple times throughout the book. I use it on various things. It's fantastic in salad dressings. It's fantastic as a garnish on sprinkled over grilled meats. Um, and really it's a finely, finely ground dried berry. So sumac berry uh, is what you're getting here. It's finely ground and dried and it's got an acidity to it. It's got a little bit of tanginess uh, and also it makes beautiful, uh, beautiful color. So it adds a beautiful red color to just about anything it touches. Now I get mine at the Middle Eastern store. I find it's the, the yes. very best place. You know, they just, it's so fresh and fabulous. And you can't normally, like, you can't get it at Whole Foods. So you've got to find it, but yes. it's the most inexpensive way to update your kitchen in a very fantastic way. It's worth, it's worth the hunt. And especially if you're, if we're talking about local businesses, visit a Middle Eastern market in your neighborhood, find one, source it out. You're going to find amazing products there as well on top of everything else. Tahini, uh, you know, uh, Aleppo pepper. You're going to find things like, Berbera spice, everything, harissa, you name it. So it's worth the shot. And then what I do is I also add some dried parsley. And this is really, if we're, if we're being honest, dried parsley has really no flavor. This is mostly, this is mostly for color and a little bit of interest uh, in, the, in the dressing. And that's gonna get all you know, uh, soaked throughout the, the salad dressing. It's gonna get, go all over the place with the, the salad itself. So I just like the way it looks. But dried parsley has very little flavor. It's mostly yeah, just says, color. I don't have dried parsley. It's perfectly fine like I'm doing here. Yeah. It's fresh. Okay. Right. Yeah, omit it. There's going to be some fresh parsley in there anyways. So you can omit it entirely. I just use it because I like the way it looks. Um, and then I've got some salt going in and I've got some freshly cracked black pepper. And this is all going in the mason jar. And then all I do is I close the lid. Terry is whisking hers until it's emulsified, which is perfectly normal and perfectly fine. And that works too. I just shake it like it owes me money over here. I love it. And this is, you know, 
I see, I see every day I see these, you know, new products on the market for this salad shaker and that vinaigrette shaker. And they're like 20 bucks. And you know, they, they got all these kind of parts to them. Just get a Mason jar. They're fantastic. You can use them for everything else and uh, they're perfect. And you've got a perfectly, you know, emulsified vinaigrette. It, right. It's wonderful, by the way. Is it good? I'm going to taste mine as well. Absolutely. It's briny, salty. Yeah. I love the sumac. I mean, I'm excited yes. about this. That's perfect. So <sighs> this now gets to hang out on the side. Just leave it be room Wait temperature. Though. Don't need to put it in the fridge or anything like that. And we're going to prep the salad. So I've got, what are you starting with, Terry? It really doesn't matter what you start yeah, with. To be I'm just working ahead a little bit. I didn't, I didn't yeah. have mine ripened, but I had the beautiful small tomatoes. So I'm just cutting some of those. Let's, yeah, uh, look, let's do the romaine. I got it right here. I've got, I've got Roma tomatoes that I found. My brother gave me half a bushel. So I'm going to use the leftover ones of these. Okay. Uh, and I've got some romaine and I don't have a salad spinner. I left it in Miami, but all I do is I rinse it and to drain the water, I just put it upside down in something like that. And then all the water collects there. So this is a good way to dry the lettuce. Fantastic. And just going to give it a rough chop. You know, okay. something you want, you want basically like, you want fork sized pieces. You want, you don't want it too thin. You don't want it shredded. You want some crunch. So, you know, about two inch wide, maybe one and a half inch wide chunks. Yesterday, and she went to Joanne's. Look at these. Oh, somebody somebody left the somebody yeah. left their mic on. Yeah, and somebody Joanne, left their mic on. Went to Joanne. Jo so let's mute yourself. Jo Joanne's in trouble. Well, Joanne, it's a no, no, no. Hey guys, I'm going to break in actually for just one second about the mics. Um, okay. As we. As we admit you guys in through the uh, waiting room, we do have your microphones off and your um, cameras off on purpose. And that's just to take away from any distractions so that everyone can enjoy the event. As people, if people do unmute themselves, I'm trying, I'm constantly flipping through and remuting them, but I don't have everyone on one page. So I can't always see it and catch it right away. So I just want to let you guys know that, that we're, we are trying. And if everyone could keep themselves muted during the presentation, that would be great. That's all. Back over to you guys. You can't go to a movie and have your cell phone ring. It's just, it's that kind of thing. Okay. The, so the other thing I should mention is I, I, the screen is very far from me and Terry. So we, can, we can't really monitor too much of the, the comments, but Terry is there and Zach is there. So uh, if you've got a mic on, maybe just flip it off and flip off the, the video also. And I still hear someone, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so I got some radishes. So lettuce is in the bowl, right? You just toss that in the bowl. Some fresh radishes. These are gigantic ones. So if the, you know, this is another thing about the recipe. If the recipe is calling for six radishes, uh, they're a sign of like small size. If you've got jumbo ones like this that are in season or whatnot, then obviously use, you know, three or four. You got to, you know, make your best, your best judgment call there. Now, if you, one trick with the radishes, because these are kind of, hard to slice thinly. Um, if you want, you can do the way Terry's doing it, which is just when you slice it tip and tail, you'll see these nice little red rings like that. And you can slice it like that. If you do it this way, one easy tip is to just make a little incision along one side of the bottom and that's going to give you a stable base nice. so it doesn't that. wobble around. Tell us about then, those knife skills of yours because they're, they're so amazing. And uh, I mean, I think when everyone thinks of you, they think of your knife skills. So how do you, and I know you were professionally trained. So tell, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, mean, I think I wasn't professionally trained. I'm just a knife nerd. You know, I'm a big nerd about knives and I like knives. And uh, I just practice, practice, practice. And you'll get good at it. Eventually, you know, you'll, as, as long as you watch enough TV and YouTube, and you try to imitate and mimic what other people are doing, then your knife skills will improve. Love it. So you can, if you didn't have, you know, great knife skills, or you wanted to get really thin slices um, like this, you know, you want really thin ones, you can use a mandolin, a Japanese mandolin as well. And that's gonna give you perfectly thin slices. Um, you just wanna make sure you keep your fingers and your fingernails intact, because those things are dangerous. 
So we've got some beautiful radish. That's going in to our faux touche salad. Yes. That's good. Next, what do we got? We'll do some cucumbers. Okay. So and I got. You like to do them on a diagonal. How do you like best to cut them? You know, you can do it however you like, whatever floats your boat. You know, you're the boss, applesauce. I think in this case, it doesn't really matter. If you want to put them on a, if you want to slice them on a bias, if you want to slice them straight down, keeping, the only thing that I recommend is keeping with the rest of the salad. You want some kind of like, you don't want them too thin, you don't want them too thick. If they're too thin, if they're, if they're too thin, you're going to lose the texture of them. They're going to fall apart and they're just going to kind of go into the rest of the salad. If they're too thick, it's going to be hard to get in one bite. So a, a happy medium, I think, is the way to go here. So I would okay. say, I don't know, maybe like a quarter of an inch, something like that, if people can see. Quarter of an inch. I do them... In this case, for whatever reason, I do them straight down. Normally, I like things on a bias. I think it looks pretty. Um, but in this case, I'll just keep it straight down. Those go all in. Salad is everything. It's vegan. It's Whole30. It's, you know, paleo. Yeah. It's gluten-free. We got a whole group. The, the, one of the things with the book is the way I, I cook at home, and this is really a reflection. The book is really a, a reflection of how I cook at home. So... A lot of the things are meant to be mixed and matched. So if you're making a fotouche, you can make the chicken shawarma to go with it, or you can make the roast chicken, uh, or you can make the roast short ribs. And everything I do at home is really family style. Like I like to serve on big platters and have everybody dig in. And uh, to me, that's the best way to celebrate food and share food. Yeah, I didn't grow up eating, you know, my, my mom never really like made plates for me and my brother, it was always, Put everything on the table and watch the, you know, watch the animals attack. And I'm that's a how it works. Gal, so I can get behind that. So I can get yeah. Water yeah, I'm all about it. So I got a beautiful red onion here. And I'm just going to peel off the outer skin. Like so. Make you know, the other thing, one question that has been popping up with people um, who haven't yet bought the book, but are on the fence. So this is, I, I love this question a lot because I think it's a fair question to ask is, how easily sourceable are the ingredients in your book? Am I gonna have to go to specialty stores? Am I gonna need to go to like a, you know, a special market? And most, almost 99.9% .9 of the recipes are made with really straightforward, easy to find ingredients. You can find pretty much any major grocery store, you might have to go to a specialty shop to maybe get some, you know, some sumac or some Aleppo pepper. But if that's the case, that's, that's really the extent of your travel. And the, the good thing is, and you know, it's so worth it. You know, it's like, it's fun to get a few, a few new ingredients. But sometimes yeah. for people who are changing, Ronnie, they, do, they are going to wind up with some new ingredients, right? You are going to get a coconut amino. You are going to need some tahini. You are going to need maybe avocado oil. There are going to be a few yeah. things, but in changing what we eat, that's part of it. And the other thing, you know, what, in the States, it's way better than in Canada. But in the States, you have so many uh, accessible ingredients, or rather, especially ingredients that are accessible in major stores. So, like, if you go to, say, um, when I was in Florida, if you go to, like, a Publix or something like that, which is the, the, the chain grocery store there, they have a fantastic selection of different things. I could find things like grain-free pasta, etc. So I think that even some of the specialty ingredients are getting more and more available. And also you can find them if you're in a pinch, you can find them online. A lot of these um, uh, smaller shops even have these boutique shops have online portals where you can purchase from. So you'll always be able to find the ingredients, I think, unless you're really, you know, far out somewhere in the woods or something, you shouldn't have an issue. Uh, and so I've got some onion. I'm just going to thin this slice. See what our favorite knives are. You know, I love anything that's sharp that cuts well. I love my Zwilling Rocking, rocking Santuco, and they don't sponsor me. I just, I love them. What are some of your favorite knives? 
One of the best knives I've ever used is the Victory Knox Fibrox Chef's Knife. It's under 50 bucks. It will out, will out perform a $200 knife, a $300 knife, uh, and it's really easy to find. I like that one. I'm using a, a fancy Miyabi. This is a Japanese chef's knife. Um, but like Terry said, you know, anything that's, the most important thing with a knife is that it's sharp and that it's comfortable in your hand. Right. That's yeah. the most important thing. If you, if, a, if a, a Zwilling is comfortable in your hand, you buy a Zwilling. If a Wusthof is comfortable in your hand, you buy a Wusthof. And also, what can you afford? Everybody's budget is different. So for me, I like one knife versus the other because it's comfort and also sharpness. Absolutely. So my onions are in. I've got some tomatoes. I'm just going to trim off these tips. And right now is like, I mean, tomatoes are just coming into season, I feel, in Toronto. Like we have a really long wait before tomatoes are in full full bloom here in Toronto. Is it the same in Chicago? No, I would say we're kind of nearing the end of our tomato season. Um, so I would say for us, it's more like the beginning of August. And, you know, I noticed that this year it feels like the farmer's market's ending a little early, like everything peaked a little earlier this year, interestingly enough. Mm. You're not going to find this surprising, but I'm going to go ahead and take my <laughs> onions because I always have these. Go and, for it. And I'm just look these rings th right in. This is the beauty. One of the things my edit, my publisher and, and Justin, my our editor, um, made me do was I put I put in "You're the Boss" applesauce just about in every single recipe, and they said this is getting really, really, really repetitive. You got to <laughs> cut it up. But in every single recipe, I want people to be able to. Um, oh, Jane, if you can mute, mute, mute your microphone, Jane. Jane Wyman, just mute yourself, Jane. Um, okay, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I yeah. love the interaction, at least. It's fantastic. Um, one of the things I want everyone to be able to do is, you know, the recipes are a blueprint. You start with the recipe. If you want to know how it should taste, in my opinion, make the recipe exactly as it is. Once you've done that, now you've got a baseline. You can do other things. You want to put in Terry's marinated onions? Go for it, by all means. You know, at the end of the day, you're the one that has to eat it. So it's got to taste good to you. If it doesn't taste good to you, then that's not the point of cooking. So I've got these tomatoes. And I like keeping the tomatoes in these, like, bite-sized chunks. Not too big, not too small. That's really the, you know, the premise of the entire salad. Not too big, not too small. So I'm going to cut these Roma tomatoes into eighths. And I think I would do about the same with the vine ripened ones, depending on how big they were. So these going in. And I'm very happy because these were sitting on my counter and now they're getting used up in this beautiful salad. And then last but the only other thing we have to add uh, are the, the, the herbs, right? right? So I've got some fresh parsley and some fresh mint. And this is really what makes the salad like really pop and sing. Um, so some fresh parsley. With and how do the I parsley. do the, uh, the mint? Do I chop it or leave it in strips or? So I chop, I finely chop it. Okay. So if you want to, all I do actually is I tear off the leaves. Mm -hmm. And I add them right to the parsley. And the recipe, I think, calls for 12 mint leaves, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 12 mint leaves. The thing with mint is it's fantastic in a salad, but it can also really take over the other flavors. So don't go really crazy on it. This is not one of those things where I would say, go big or go home. A yeah. little bit goes a long way. I like that. Yeah. Mine looks beautiful, I have to say. I'm very, very pleased when I just show you. Oh, that looks fantastic. So I've just rolled it up so it makes it a little bit easier to chop. And then you give that a fine chop. And the other thing with the parsley, these top stems, the top soft stems, I chop those up too. Me too, I love those. Yeah, those are perfectly fine. They're edible, they're crunchy. 
especially in a salad. You just got to chop them really fine um, because they're a little bit stringy otherwise. But those top parts, and they're super, like, they're super aromatic. I smell them. They're punching me in the face right now with their aroma. Uh, and they're really full of parsley flavor. So that's a great, great addition to the salad. Now it goes in the bowl. Dressing over. I'm going to put mine on the platter, I think. Oh, my gosh. This smells lovely. So we got that. And that's it. That's your salad. Well, beautiful. And it smells. It's very aromatic and beautiful. Yeah. This is, you know, it's a really straightforward garden salad. But the dressing and the vinaigrette is what's going to be the, the, the deal the deal sealer. Is that a saying? Is deal sealer a saying? If it isn't, I, I want it to be one. Let's make it be one. Let's, let's get okay. it. It's right the deal sealer. Bitcoins. Trademark. Right, let's do it. <laughs> so I got my salad. I'm going to drizzle the vinaigrette over top. And the best thing, you know, with this, I would say most salads, you don't want to like have it sit around for too long. With this one, I would say let it sit for like 10 to 15 minutes okay. because what's going to happen is the salt in the, in the vinaigrette is going to start pulling out the liquid from the tomatoes and also the cucumbers and also the lettuce. And that's going to get worked into the vinaigrette further. So you're going to have something that's really beautifully balanced with the dilution of the liquid and the vinegar and the lemon juice. So... This just great. Gets I, I like feeding it up with a forkful right out of here. <laughs> so, Ronnie, how did this all get started? Tell us about, tell me about your pathway that got you here. Oh, man. You know, this has become the most commonly asked question. And it's such a long story that I have to make short. So, I got to make a long story short by saying, essentially, I had a very lifelong battle struggle with, um, being overweight as a child um, and through even through my adolescence and early early adulthood I always struggled to uh, lose weight and and live up to some expectation of myself that was handed to me mostly by my brother who is an absolute just like natural born athlete who is su super fit and can eat everything under the sun and stay in shape and I was eating the same stuff as him and obviously having a very different reaction um, physically. And so I would try to diet and I would try these kind of really, uh, uh, these diets that are very boring, like, you know, restrict myself of every food that I love, uh, stop eating things that are delicious, count calories, count macros, this and that. And it's just so unbelievably frustrating and difficult to sustain. Um, and it got to the point where I had tried just about every diet in the book. I had failed each of them twice. And I said, this is, this is crazy because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to essentially lose X amount of pounds by Y days, which is such an arbitrary goal to hit. It means nothing. You know, the numbers on the scale, as many of us are starting to learn, mean absolutely nothing when it comes to what's more important, which is feeling great, uh, being healthy, being active. And so I said, I need to go about things differently. I need to start focusing on things that I think are much more important to a healthy life overall. And so I, on the night of my 27th birthday, I wrote a list of 10 resolutions that had nothing to do with the scale. So there were things like just breathe, talk less, listen more, embrace all emotions, um, be more environmentally conscious. And these things I felt, if I could focus on these, then the process is what's going to deliver the result as opposed to focus on the result. And then, you know, it's, a, it's mayhem with the process. You just do whatever you got to do to get there. And that was really a non, not an enjoyable experience for me. So after the night of my 27th birthday, the next day I started, I didn't wait until the new year. My birthday falls on December 23rd. And in the past, I'd always said, you got to wait till the new year. The new year's coming. That's when your resolution is going to kick in. Diet starts on Monday, that sort of thing. And I would always inevitably make excuses for myself. I would say, you'll start tomorrow. Tomorrow would roll around. And I'd say, well, you know, I'm, you're, the fellas are going out for a beer. Start the next day. And so I said, no, I'm starting tomorrow. 
And I continued, and that was really a, a, a very pivotal moment for me. Along the way, I was making really great strides. I was healthy, I was feeling great, but I plateaued. And I stopped seeing the physical results and that kind of discouraged me. And so a friend of mine introduced me to paleo. He said, you got to try paleo. I've been doing it and I feel great. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And my body transformed drastically. I regained confidence because I was taking ownership of what I was putting in my body. I felt as though I was no longer a hostage to food and food decisions. Uh, and this became really, really instrumental in creating a positive feedback loop where I would see the results, feel good, and want to be encouraged to keep going with it. As opposed to, I wouldn't see the results, feel terrible, go back to really bad habits. Uh, and so I started cooking paleo pretty much exclusively for the first, you know, first several months, probably. And uh, friends of mine had asked me for recipes. They would see what I was making and say, oh, that looks really good. Can you share the recipe? And it got to the point where I was you know, on the phone with my friends for 30 minutes, an hour, walking them through step by step saying, this is when you put in the sweet potato, put the chicken in now. And that wasn't a very effective use of time. So a friend of mine said, you need to start a blog. I didn't know what a blog was. So he built a blog for me. Uh, and that's how it grew. I just started sharing recipes and the community started sharing them with their, with their friends and their family. They cooked. It grew very grassroots and organically. And uh, I found Whole30 along the way. Whole30 really opened their arms and embraced me in terms of a community. And also the, the Whole30 team really promoted me and championed me. Um, and I felt as though I finally sort of found my tribe. These are people who, you know, love to eat. They, they want good food, but they also want to feel great at the end of the day. And so that just naturally led to a, a book idea um, and it really happened at a very, a very kind of fateful time where I was teaching uh, part-time, but really all over the place. So it was almost teaching overtime at different colleges in Toronto, in the Toronto area. And I got an email from uh, my literary agent, from Lisa. And Lisa said, hey, well, you know, would you like to write a book? And before I, I, I had been proposed a proposition by other publishers asking me to write a book, but it, ne it was never the right time. Because if I was going to write a book, a cookbook, I knew the process. I knew how much was involved. I wouldn't do it unless I could be 150% committed to it. So at this point, I said, I'm going to jump in with both feet. I'm going to do the book full time. I'm going to take a step back from teaching. And this is really where the, the book came in. And for the past two years, we've been working on it. It's finally out. Right. So everyone can, can have it. And you know, it's a long, you know, it's a long time. You were you were one of the first, you're the second Whole30 endorsed books, book authors. And uh, it's, you're kind of in a pipeline, so to speak. So there's a lot of time that's coming out, but it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm very, very excited that the book is out, that people are cooking from it, people are liking it, which is the most important thing. Uh, and yeah, and that's how, you know, it's all happened very, one thing has led to another. It's never been a forced kind of situation. I love all of the different flavors that you're cooking with. And I'm wondering, you know, what would you say your, your profile is? I mean, because it's like, you've got the Moroccan this and you've got the, you know, Moho Loco, you've got, you know, um, so many different things. And I'm just wondering what you'd say about yourself. You've got your mother's matzo balls. Uh, but I, when I'm looking through the book, it's you've got Moroccan this, you've got amazing things. Tell me about that. What is, what is your, what, what, who are you as a spice person? Uh, well, I mean, look, the thing is, and I think you can relate to this, and I think most people at home can relate to this. I'm not a professionally trained chef. I'm, I'm a home cook. I'm self-taught. I don't have a culinary background where I went to the south of France to learn cooking or northern Italy or, uh, you know, the Culinary Institute of America. I'm not a, I'm not a professionally trained chef where I, I worked in a restaurant and I cook exclusively Greek food or I cook exclusively Mediterranean or exclusively Italian or exclusively Vietnamese, whatever the case may be. For me, my culinary identity was the one thing I thought probably one of the, well, one of the most things I thought about before writing the book, what recipes are gonna fill this book? I mean, do I, and I write this actually in, in one of the, the prefaces is, 
do I just stick to one thing? Is it only going to be my background? My parents are from former USSR. My mother is from Lithuania. My father's from Moldova. But when they came to Canada, they just said it was, it was easier to say they were from Russia because it was former USSR. So do I just exclusively borrow from that? And I thought about it and I said, the more I thought about it, the more I went back to the foods I ate as a kid that I associate with feelings of nostalgia and comfort and my identity and also the city I live in. Toronto is insanely multicultural. It is insanely diverse. It is probably, I think, still the most multicultural city in the world. Over 51% of its population is from another country. People that live here are from another country. Uh, and it's unbelievably well represented in terms of you can go onto one block and find everything from a Korean restaurant to a Vietnamese, to a Lebanese, to a Jamaican, to a Portuguese restaurant, all in one block. It's fantastic. And this is, these are the foods I ate growing up. And these are the foods I wanna recreate in an accessible and healthy way for other people to enjoy regardless of restrictions. So if somebody's suffering from a gluten allergy, I don't want them to miss out on a fotouche because they can't have the bread. You can make the fotouche. Right. The, the goal obviously is to honor and respect and you know, pay homage to the cultural identity of the recipe. And that's I, one thing I hope the most when I'm using and borrowing and celebrating these recipes and these flavors and these spices like sumac, that people aren't misinterpreting them as appropriation, but rather celebration. So I love that's- that. I said that in the book and I think that's amazing. And I, I love that. That is certainly in the spirit you know, of who you are. Um, and I think, I think you've been very successful at doing it. What are, what are some of your very favorite, I know it's like the question everyone asks, but the reality is people want to know this about your book. And we want people to buy your book. And I think it's a great book. What are some of the recipes that you love the most in the book? I mean, oh my I, God. I mean, Picadello, what it like, your Picadello precedes itself. Everyone knows that you make the Picadello. And when I think about the Whole30 hamburger, you are the inventor. I mean, you just, <laughs> like you've taken those pictures that are like, can anyone ever get a picture as good as Ronnie has of that? <laughs> of you, I do think of some of those dishes, but what other ones are we excited to, to learn about? You know, some of the things, some of the things in the book are fan favorites that I borrowed from the blog, because I really wanted to have some of those in there, because one thing that people were taught, hinting at when, when I sort of teased the fact that I was working on a project, is they were excited that they finally didn't have to print out every recipe on the blog. So I said, okay, I'm going to include the fan favorites. So there are about 20 of them in there. The picadillo is definitely one of them, the Cuban inspired ground beef. It's such a, such a crowd pleaser. It's so insanely easy to make. So that one's definitely a favorite. The other favorites, if I'm being, you know, I've been asked this question, I can never figure out the answers, but I'm just going to try to answer as best as I can. I really like the roasted short ribs. That's on page, let me see. They look the roasted, so amazing and, and very exotic. So the roasted short ribs are on page 92. Um, I love this recipe so much because it's so incredibly easy and it's, it's such a like showstopper of a presentation. So when you put this on the table, when I, when I shot the book, when we, I worked with a, a really amazingly talented local food photographer, Donna Griffith, and I work with an insanely talented prop stylist, Laura Branson, to shoot the book. I styled all the photos. But one thing we did was we ate every single recipe. And this was one of, by far, the favorites. The other favorite is the Cajun cod with red pepper and spinach cream sauce. So easy and super delicious where you would never think something this easy and delicious and healthy can come together so quickly. Uh, so that's a really good one. The cover photo I love, you know, on this yeah, is the Canadian I cover photo. Yeah, my stories, right? Yeah. yeah. So you've got you've got the American version, which has, you know, if anybody's wondering if they see two different versions at home, but Terry has the American version. This is the Canadian cover, and that's the only difference of the book. Just my Canadian publisher decided to go with a different cover photo, which is has the basil beef on it. Both of the cover photos are superstars. They're my cover girls. I love them very much. Um, but really, I'm the kind of guy that cooks 
with the seasons. So depending on what's available um, and depending on, you know, what's affordable because tomatoes are going to be super expensive in a couple months. So I tend not to use tomatoes so much in the winter, but fennel is all over the place. So I'll use a lot of fennel and I'll make my fennel and celery slaw. And um, I'm a kind of like, you know, what am I in the mood for kind yeah. of cook? You know, so it depends. My favorite can depend on the season. And also, do I need something that's really quick and easy, like a back pocket stir fry? Or do I want to put like, am I going to put together my mom's matzo ball soup? Like, that's a, a bit of an undertaking. So those, and I got to say my, my, my grandma's borscht, my babushka bronya's borscht, which is for me probably one of the most, what's the, what's the word I could use? cherished recipes because for me it's nothing but fond memories thinking back of my grandma in her kitchen uh you know using nothing more than a paring knife and a, and a tiny little cutting board to make the most incredible meal so that's a, a really important recipe in the book for me so then you know obviously uh, i've named i've named every single recipe I in the book to answer your question. there's a 10 year old that wants to know from you and i what um, what's it, what inspires each of us to start cooking? Like, oh man, what inspires us to start cooking? Of course, and loving to eat, you know, yeah. and the joy of like yesterday, I I had a day to myself and I wasn't going to cook, and then I started on this dish and I just got everything out of the refrigerator, and it was like it, I it felt so harmonious, I felt so good doing it. It just was like I kind of unplugged from the whole world and I just got in my groove. Um, and I think if you're yeah. lucky enough in a lifetime to have things you love to do, and for you and I, it might be food. For somebody, it could be music. I, you, obviously, for music, you too. But um, he wants to know, yes, from you, what inspired what inspired you to really start cooking? Even And did you cook before the whole paleo thing? Were you inspired yeah, so to cook? I have a really complicated, and I guess it's not difficult, different from other people. I don't think my story, to be honest, I don't think my story is very unique. I think it's one that's shared by a lot of people. I grew up wanting certain foods that were unhealthy. I wanted junk food because my mom is a fantastic cook. She's a brilliant cook. The difference is when she was raising my brother and I, we were a handful. So she would really just throw things together really quickly and get done with it. So there were things that maybe I, I as a picky kid, didn't want to eat. And so what I did was I taught myself to cook so that I could eat things I wanted to eat. I wanted lasagna, I wanted cheeseburgers, I wanted, you know, mac and cheese. And my mom would not cook these things. My mom and my parents were always very much uh, health conscious people, always on the kind of cusp of what's healthy. And I, I'm a kid, I don't want to eat that stuff. I want something delicious. So I taught myself to cook to, to you know, kind of satisfy that craving. It kind of in a way, it's a blessing, but in a way, it was a curse because I was eating all these things that were not built for me. The foods right. I loved did not love me back. Let's just say that, right? Right. And so I taught myself to cook for that reason. But along the way, it became super pivotal to me because it helped me regain my health. If I didn't know how to cook, then I would have been left scrambling to find a way to support a healthy lifestyle so that I'm not reliant on packaged foods and convenient foods or processed foods. So for me, the, the inspiration to cook is the inspiration to eat. I want to eat delicious things. And if I'm going to go on a health journey and I'm going to try to be healthy, I want to make sure that I don't give up delicious foods. Otherwise, it's not sustainable for me. I'm the kind of guy that I love to cook. I live to eat. So for me, it's super important to have that part of my life. Food is so instrumental and, and part of my life. My wife, on the other hand, she could eat whatever and be totally happy. You know, she could eat boiled eggs and a, and a hot dog and call it dinner, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day of the week and not think twice about it. I'm not, that's not me, you know? And I love experimenting and the, you know, part of it is the, the creative outlet of it, right? To create something from scratch is, beautiful to me. It's that's amazing. part of the process. Right. Yeah. So that's really, for me, I don't know if that answers the question. And of course it does. What do you hope to pass along to your daughter in terms of all of this? 
Oh, man. you know, the, th the three things I say in the book, work hard, be kind, never take no for an answer. Those are, those are things that I live by every single day. I try to instill in myself right. and hopefully in her, because with those things, I think they're, you know, I think they're cornerstones for living a, a, a happy and fulfilled life. And I don't mean by, you know, by work hard. I don't mean, you know, break your back. I mean, really be passionate about the things you're doing. If you're going to do something, do it fully, do it to the best of your abilities. Um, be kind, you know, there's no reason not to be in my opinion. Um, and never take no for an answer. I mean, there's you, doors are going to close. Yep. Doors are going to close, but you gotta, you gotta open up some doors yourself if they don't open up for you. You gotta do and it. And that's it. You gotta yeah. do it. When I wanted to ask you, when you got that letter from Lisa, was she your agent then? Because you and I have a similar kinds of things. We got offered deals with Whole30 and it's a little different. Was Lisa your agent or did she reach out to you just completely blindly? No, she, so Lisa Grubka, our beloved Lisa. Lisa, if you're watching, hello. Um, Lisa Cole called me. She just sent me an email one day. And, you know, I write this in the book. It was a very fateful day. Um, Lisa is a literary agent. We had no relationship. It was a, an email out of the blue saying, I have, I think you'd write a fantastic cookbook. And if you're interested in it, I think we can put together a really great proposal and keep things in a, a way, in a manner that you can control, um, that you have creative input into and line you up with a great, a great publisher. At the time, Whole30 endorsed wasn't even in the picture that came along after. And yeah. when I found, when I found out that Whole30 wanted to endorse the book, I was over the moon because for me, Whole30 is such a, such a, first of all, it's such an incredible program. That's number one. Second of all, they've been nothing but supportive of myself and others and really created a platform on top of a platform for us to be able to share with, you know, like-minded individuals and a, a, a large community that share interests. So, that's how the book came about. I love that. Well, it's interesting. I, I read through your book. I read it cover to cover. One of the things that I, that I thought was true, I loved what Melissa wrote your forward and she wrote mine. So it was really fun reading yours, you know, and saying, oh yeah. But one of the things is, is that she said, you know, you're just like a favorite. I mean, and of course, when you come over to Whole30, there is no one that gets more likes and comments on their initial picture. And then you know, when people love you, they love your spirit, your heart your food, you know, but also I think you're fun and all that and you draw people in. So you are, you know, you're a favorite for Whole30 and you and I have been so lucky to be a part of that community, to be embraced in the way that we have, yes. you know, to have these fantastic opportunities to partner with Whole30 for a book. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. One yeah. of the other things that I really liked, like about you is that earlier this year, you know, you know, you, you know, you spoke up in some really powerful ways, but people like to keep us in a box. We just, you know, you're Terry and Ronnie, we only want you to discuss this one thing, food, please don't discuss anything else. And we're both, you know, a, some people with some personalities who, you know, you can get in that thing where you feel like you have to please people and do that. But what you said, and I, I will never forget it, but it was like, um, you know, I am going to speak my heart and I'm paraphrasing. Um, and if, you know, if it works for you, great, but I really am looking for uh, followers for leaders. Um, and I'm not going to stay in a box because people want me to. So just tell me a little bit about that. I, I, I had such just unbelievable admiration for you and the way that you handled that greatly. Well, I mean, you know, I don't think anybody, anyone, nobody with a food blog wakes up and the next morning thinks I'm going to become an activist of any kind, you know, so what I, one thing that I've always said from day one is when I started the blog and when Instagram became part of this vehicle for sharing recipes and ideas and drawing people to the blog, I never liked the terminology follower. I, I've always taken issue with this term, I have followers or follow, because to me, it immediately creates a power duo, like a power dynamic that isn't there to begin with. In fact, it's probably the opposite. The followers are the ones who empower the people they follow. If you have a, 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 any kind of public sphere or you have an online business, you are, at, you know, you are only as successful as, your com as you make your community to be successful. If your community is not successful, then what are you doing? You know, like what, what are you here for? And so 
I've never liked this, this term followers. And so that, that resonated during this, you know, huge racial justice movement and civil rights movement. And, you know, sometimes you're not, you know, I'm not an avocado. I'm not going to please everybody. You know, that's the one thing that I've, I've come to grips with. My goal is to be truthful to myself, make a positive impact and build a community that is full of like-minded individuals where people lead, right? And they lead within their own communities, not just in this social media world. So that's how, that's really the gist of it. It's, it's just being truthful to the fact that there is gonna be times where you're gonna to have to go against the grain and, and speak your mind for, for the right thing. It's never a wrong time to do the right thing. That's really my, my position on that. I like that. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I admire you. You know, I admire you greatly and I admire the stance you took and you know, it's a similar stance that I taken and I've quoted you many times, you know, because I think it's, uh, it's a good one. One thing I wanna ask you is you, you've got Canada and then Miami and now you're back to Canada. Where, where, where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> when, when I did the event with Alex from the Define Dish, she said, are you in Miami? I said, no, I'm back in Toronto. I, I, I don't know, I guess people are confused because I only tend to show myself in a kitchen. <laughs> so I don't make people so get a, always know, a you know. sense of things. Um, but I, my grandparents, when they came here from, they first, they came here from Lithuania, they stopped in Israel. So they went from Lithuania to Israel to New York. Okay, so their first the point uh, of arrival, my grandparents, when they came to North America was in New York and they lived there, they were in Queens for a few years. And when, they're, when they retired, their health took a turn for a bit of the worse. My, father had di my grandfather had diabetes. So they decided, let's go to a warmer climate. So they moved down south to Florida, as, you know, many people do, you go to a warmer climate. So they were there for 20 years, you know, before they passed away. So I grew up visiting my grandparents in, in Miami once, twice, three times a year when I was a kid growing up. And it was my favorite place in the entire world. I love Miami. I love Florida. I love everything about it. The sunshine, the beach, the people, the food, the culture. It's um, amazing. I mean, yeah. it's fantastic. Um, it's an endless summer, you know, and coming from Toronto, we have... And it's the same in Chicago, I think. Right, we get, need an endless summer. <laughs> you get two months out of the year yeah. where it's, you know, where it's sunny. So when they passed away, we kept their apartment. We were renting it out for uh, quite some time because we didn't know, you know, my parents didn't know what they wanted to do with it. And, uh, and then this past in January, um, we decided we're going to try to put it on the market to sell for other reasons that are, you know, within the family decided to sell it. And, uh, and I said, you know, while it's on the market, let's go down there and spend a couple months because it's like, we'll never get this chance again. Wow. Catalina, my wife was on maternity leave. I work from home and I'm flexible in, in terms of that. And Sophia was young enough where we could, you know, travel fairly easily where she doesn't have to go to school or anything like that. And so we said, let's do it. And so we were down there for two and a half months. It was best time of my adult life. I'm telling I, hand to God, we loved every minute of it. And then obviously the pandemic hit, borders started closing. So we came back up to Toronto. We've been here since mid-March. Um, and yeah, we've just been riding out, you know, the, so the storm, so to speak, with everybody else yep. and making, you know, making the best of it during the, the, the warm weather, because now the weather's going to turn and it's uh, the right. Canadian winters are tough. <laughs> well, can we can we expect you to go back there? Once the borders open, of course. Yeah, I have a full I have a full kitchen. I left all my stuff down there. Great. I gotta yeah. go get my salad spinner. <laughs> so, what are you the most proud of? What am I the most proud of? Oh gosh. Well, my daughter, first of all. Yeah. Um, but I'll give my wife can take most credit for that. Um, my wife is fantastic in terms of raising Sophia, taking care of Sophia. Truly amazing. So I'm proud of, you know, I'm proud of myself. I'm, I, I, You've done a lot I think that I, sorry. You've done a lot to be proud of. Well, I mean, you know, I, 
I think that humility is very important for for me personally. I've always been a fairly humble person. I don't like to, you know, toot my own horn, so to speak. I don't like to necessarily, I'm not a good self promoter, but I've, you know, I have always felt as though I've had to try twice as hard as other people that I've grown up with who are, you know, really great at what they do. So to be able to call a passion now a career and be able to, you know, really play this through is something I'm very proud of. And, but my pride is, again, it's based almost entirely on community. Without the support of this kind of community, the book wouldn't have happened the way it happened to the point where I could take a step back from teaching um, and really make this something that's a, a you know, a, a passion pursuit, um, but also a career. So that's really instrumental to me. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm also proud of the fact that in a place like social media, which can be extremely scary and, and often, you know, vicious in terms of anonymity, I think anonymity gives people a kind of, you know, license to act in a way they normally would never act. I have 99.9% .9 positive experience. And I think it's largely based on you, you get back what you put out. You know, if you put out negative vibes, you're going to attract those vibes. Right. So I'm, I'm really proud of, I'm proud of the community that I've built. And I know that we share a large, a large part of our community is shared. So it's, I think it's, I can only imagine the same for you. Yeah. I mean, I always would have wanted you to have on the book, you know, would love to have you on my book tour. And there was always this thought we were maybe going to go to Toronto because I have a publisher in, you know, Canada also. And it was like, we would absolutely love to come. We will fly ourselves. We tried to work it out and it did never work out. But it, I really it absolutely wanted you to. And I, I feel the same. I mean, my, the community that, that I've built, when, when, or there's so much crossover with you, me, and Alex. And it's been, it's amazing. And it's 99%. You, you have that. And then you do have that half a percent where it's like, oh, wow, you know. Um, That's okay. You know what I've realized? I've also realized it's totally fine. A lot of times, sometimes you need to hear things from a different perspective and, you know, reassess yourself. Because maybe someone is, you know, pointing out something that wasn't obvious to me to begin with. And that's, I take it as a learning experience yeah. lately. I mean, more so than ever before. I've been finding, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to trip. I'm going to fall. Um, my goal is not to be malicious or in any way, but always to try to do right by people. Um, and I, that, that is a really important for me in terms of, continuing to build community that's inclusive, that's positive, that's supportive, uh, and provide, you know, in my case, what I want to do really, and it's the same thing with the book, I want to provide tools and resources for people to cook, to make healthy decisions, so that they're not necessarily forced to eat out of a bag or a box, you know, and to, to make things from home, take ownership, and enjoy, and savor, and share, uh, and really be passionate about the stuff that we're feeding ourselves because it's all it's all connected, right? If you feel yeah. great, if you feel great, you look great. You want to continue to feel great and create a positive feedback loop. That's what it's all about. Well, I think you did a really good job. I love sort of the range of you know some easy things, some harder things, all the different you know just so many different flavors, spices, a lot of wonderful things like the salads. So I think it's a great book for everyday weeknight eating. I like that we're both, you know, completely self-taught, you know, same thing for me. I never planned to be a blogger. I didn't even know what a blogger was, but people kept coming. And then it was like, yeah. well, what are we going to do? How are we going to share the recipe? I can't, how many times can I say, you know, my daughter ended up at opening this Facebook for me and shared it with friends. We shared it with friends. We shared it with friends. Mm -hmm. We shared it with friends. But I have to say, go back 79 posts and you can find the, the recipe for heroin chicken. You know, so it, 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 there is that thing where we've just been thrust in a world and it's been, I mean, a blessing and like what an amazing ride and so much fun. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. I mean, look, it's, it's incredibly rewarding to do this on your own, but now the way that we consume recipes is so different than when it was, when I was growing up, probably the same when you were growing up. We didn't have social media. I couldn't get a recipe from a blogger. I had to watch television and wait for whatever, you know, celebrity chef was on TV throwing it down, or I would have to buy a cookbook. But now you've got blogs, you've got YouTube, you've got Instagram, you've got all kinds of resources. You have master classes you can take part in. You don't have, 
you don't have to be, you know, I, you know, I hate to say this, but you don't have to go to culinary school to learn to cook. You, you, really, don't, you really don't have to. You definitely can if you want to. I think it's fantastic vocation. I think it's an incredible career. It's a tough and challenging career. But the best cooks in my life, my grandmother, my mother, they never went to culinary school. Right. And they could throw down like nobody else. So, you know, for me, you don't got to go to culinary school. Just, you know, practice, 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 trial and error. See what you like. See what your family likes and take it from there. It's a lot of fun. I love some of your old school recipes like um, the stroganoff, you know, and the Oscar. I just think I'm a girl who loves to take an old school recipe and then spin it so that it's, you know, a whole 30 paleo. But those are some of the ones that I'm most excited, you know, to try. What didn't I ask you about the book? I mean, I, I, I think we've got a little time for questions and I hope we do. And so if people have questions, I know Carrie's going to come back on and, and uh, you know, and people, you know, put them in the chat and ask. Uh, but my last question is, what didn't I ask you about the book that I should have asked you? Oh, I don't know. Where can you buy it? Let's say that. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> buy it from Anderson's and we would really love buy the book. It. Right. Please Anderson's do buy it from out. Anderson's. I put the link in the chat several times. <laughs> Um, so yeah, please, I mean, please, please, please. <laughs> yeah, but that's also, to be honest, that's a fairly commonly asked question. So yeah. if you're joining us today, please do buy the book. Uh, we've, you know, Anderson's was gracious enough to open up different ticketing options for us to make it available to everyone was unbelievably kind and generous. Um, but please, if you can order a copy of my book, order a copy of Terry's book as well. It's fantastic. If you don't already have it, I'm sure everyone already does, but if you don't, please get it as well. And um, but yeah, please. As well, right? Yeah, and please, and please order it through Andersons because with Andersons, obviously, we're supporting. You're not just supporting me and Terry. You're supporting local business in the process, and you'll get a signed cookbook, which is something I think is fun and cool. It maybe it devalued the book by putting my signature in there, but maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I want to say, if, if they've made it through two pandemics, we could learn yeah. something from Anderson. That's We've right. made it through it all, but yeah, no, this, this one has us worried. And, and to piggyback on what you guys said, your, your purchase through us, it really does make a difference. And we do greatly appreciate it. Um, it makes a difference in your community too, when you think about it, because, you know, the taxes you pay us pave your roads and employ your, um, your first responders. And, you know, that, that is definitely an important piece and why it's so important to support local business. So there's room for all sorts of business, I think. We just have to figure out the balance between us and the internet. Um, we have right. any questions from the Yeah, audience? we do have some questions through the chat. Um, in the interest of time, I want to let everyone know, thank you so much for, um, continue, for all the questions we've gotten through the chat. Some of them have already been answered through your guys' presentation and your back and forth. I'll be just kind of picking and choosing a few. I don't want anyone to feel like they got slighted if I don't get to yours in the interest of time. So let's see, there are some great ones. I copied and pasted them all here. Uh, oh, a little bit of housekeeping before I start. Uh, we did get a couple people who, ch who privately chatted me and asked uh, when the books will be shipped that were purchased today um, and for this event. And that answer is that we actually have a human being who does our shipping, one human being. Um, and she will be in the office on Monday morning and she'll start getting them all shipped out um, to you guys that day. And they will include uh, Ronnie's uh, signature and then Terry I don't think we had book plates from you I can't remember no. if yours would be signed as well or if it's just Ronnie's um, but they should start getting shipped out Monday morning to you guys um, I also had a couple people ask me they had not paid for shipping when they purchased their ticket there were two different ticket options one was just the book and one was the book with shipping uh, don't panic if you accidentally purchased it without shipping you can just either call our store uh, Monday morning and ask for Ginny and she will take care of that for you or um, a couple of you I gave I gave her direct email, but you can also email me right there at the um, email address above my head, and I can also make sure that we take care of you for that, just so that you guys know. So don't panic. We'll get it to you. Um, other than that, let's start with the actual questions here. Uh, Jan asked, "Real, this is a quick one, the Whole30 hamburger that Terry referenced, is it in Ronnie's book? I can't find it. Is it the Greek lamb burger? Thanks. Yes. So that, that's one of the recipes. Um, I think Terry was referring to. I, I like to do the lettuce bun. You know, I like to put uh, burgers on lettuce buns. And there's a, you know, 
Um, there's a kind of step-by-step -step photograph in there. I'll try to pull it up. Um, where you can learn how to make epic lettuce buns so they don't fall apart on you. There you go. We just want you to come over and teach us how to take the picture, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks for so that. That's, that's it. Um, okay, and this is a great one that I think actually probably everybody has this question too. Uh, it's for both of you. Are, do you guys have any pro tips for starting and then getting through the Whole30 program? Oh, Terry, do you wanna, do you wanna well, field that one? Yeah, it's prep, prep, prep. I mean, get everything bad out. You know, uh, I'm doing a group right now with Stephanie, Cook by Color. Um, it, it's great to do it in a group and to have a coach if by chance you can, you can do that. But my thing is like prep. Make your Whole30 mayo, make your coleslaw, get your pistachio pesto, one of my sauces or one of Ronnie's sauces. Get your marinated onions, get everything ready to roll, have emergency stuff and protein made and make, you know, everyday roast chicken breast and chop it up and have it because you, you, you're gonna get hungry and you've got to be prepared. And it is, I, I mean, this is just my opinion. It's not easy to go out and eat and do Whole30. I, when I'm doing it, I just like to eat in. That's my own personal thing. And I know you can go to Chipotle and all kinds of places now. But I just, I don't, I just want to know what I'm eating. So get prepared and just realize, think of the things you've done in your life that have been 30 days that have been, think of the things you've made it through that have been really hard. If you can do that, you can do this. So don't let yourself off the hook. Make the goal. I'm on day, I think, six right now. I wanted to cheat very badly two days ago, but I'm like, I have made the commitment to myself. I'm going to make it. What do you think, Ronnie? I agree 1000% with all of that. I think preparation is the key to success. If you... If you prepare to fail, you fail to prepare. So I think that's, I greatly agree with that. I would also say, if you, know, if you're, if you find yourself struggling, it, it's probably a sign that you need to maybe keep things a bit simpler. So don't necessarily think about making a full production every time it's dinner. Rely on leftovers for uh, easy breakfasts and lunches. In fact, I'm, so I'm starting my Whole30 tomorrow. I'm starting with the official start date. And uh, I plan on like, I have some salad. I'm going to put some salad aside for a lunch tomorrow. It's okay if it's a little, you know, if it's a little wilted, whatever. You know, just, you just got to get through. The most important thing I think is with the Whole30, you got to keep your eye on the prize. Like don't focus on some arbitrary number on a scale where you might be accustomed to thinking of if you've tried any other kind of programs before that encourage that sort of thing, forget about it. Enjoy the process because it's truly transformative if you allow it to be. And, uh, you know, and also make it a communal thing. If you've got a, you know, if you've got a, a partner at home or you're cooking for your family, then, you know, slowly introduce it to them as well. Don't force anybody to do anything they don't want to do. Um, they got, otherwise they're just going to resent you for it. But if you do it, you know, kindly invite someone and say, Hey, I'm, you know, you want to join me in on this and that's it. My wife's not doing it. For example, I said, Hey, honey, I'm starting tomorrow. Do you want to join me? She said, no. I said, okay, no problem. I'll make you other things. No, no worries. Um, but yeah, just keep it simple, prep, plan, and you should be totally fine. Great. Um, I wanted to share one thing too. Linda said, earlier in the chat when you were talking about Aleppo pepper that she had found it at World Market. So I just wanted to share that with everybody because I thought that was a great tip. Um, okay, our next question from Tanya. Um, and this is one I was kind of curious about as well, to be honest. Uh, a lot of these recipes seem to also be keto friendly. How do you guys both feel about keto? Well, I'll start there. In the book, if a recipe is keto, it's by default. I didn't, set, I didn't set out to, to, to um, develop any keto recipes. But one of the things that people will find is there's a lot of overlap between paleo, keto, and Whole30. Um, so for example, this salad would probably be considered keto. There might be a bit of sugar in the tomatoes, but um, this would be a keto-friendly salad, I would say. Uh, it just depends on what you're going to pair it with. So... If you're doing one of those other programs, there, there are recipes in there for you. But for me, I, I tend to stay in the Whole30 and Paleo laneways for two reasons. One, I find that it's, the, it's more sustainable for me personally. 
Two, I feel like that's where I can contribute the most to. And uh, well, that's, two. did I say three reasons or two reasons? I'll make it three reasons. <laughs> and the third reason is, um, I find that with, in terms of sustainability, for me, I, I can't be bothered with counting things. I, I can't count macros and carbs. It's just not, I'll give up. So it doesn't work for me. I've tried it. It's not for me. Um, but if people, I know people have great success with keto, but it's also very hard to sustain for a long period of time. So my approach is if you're going to start with something, start with Whole30. It's 30 days, black and white set of rules, so many resources available for you um, and really clear cut. There's a lot of uh, and, and literature on it. Um, and then after you can, during the reset and the, the reintroduction phase, you can start introducing things that aren't Whole30, things like legumes and whatnot, see how that feels. And then maybe veer into a paleo lifestyle where you're focusing on meats, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole foods, that sort of thing, with some moderation indulgences um, that you like, for example. I'm gonna say ditto to everything. I accidentally have some keto recipes, um, but it's, it's by accident. Yeah, it's a happy accident. Okay. Um, oh, this is a great one from Jacqueline. Uh, for someone who has no cooking experience at all, how do you recommend that one learns how to pair their foods? Meaning like no, knowing what goes well together. Mm, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, it's a great one. I would say it's, it's the same way I pair. Um, think it's the same way I think about using fats to cook. So if I'm developing a recipe and I want to make something like a fotouche or a fatouche salad. For the dressing, I'm going to look to what are the kinds of oils that are used in the Middle East. Olive oil is a huge one. And that's going to be kind of like a guide towards the flavor profile. So I think about what do they eat in different parts of the world. So if I'm eating a fatouche, what do they pair it with? What, are, what else is made over there? And I think, oh, there's a, in, the, in the book, there's a recipe for shawarma. So that would go together. I think that's a fairly common uh, match. So if you keep things within the same culinary sphere or cultural sphere, you're almost always going to have a good match. There's also opportunity to mix and match cultures too, right? Like, you know, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. I'm drawing a blank. But a good way to approach it is to think about cultural similarities. Where, what, what is the cultural background of this recipe? Is there another one? If it's not in my book, maybe it's in Terry's book. If it's not in Terry's book, maybe it's in Alex's book. And see how you can mix and match those. So I wouldn't get worked. I wouldn't get also, I wouldn't stress over it. Right. Pair things with how you like them, right? You got to eat it at the end of the day. And I mean, you can make it simpler than that. It's like, let's say you're not getting into all of all of that and you just they're saying like with a roast chicken you can pair really any vegetable in a lump of salad i mean don't overthink things what yeah. do you like the taste of together you know like when i see a beautiful salad it's like is this, this is going to go with any protein you could do lamb chops you could do pork you could do beef you could do hamburgers with it so keep it simple and here's the thing about cooking just get started embrace it get to your farmer's market meet the farmers and the growers Start getting in there. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because along the way to succeeding in the kitchen, there's, there's some failing that goes along with that. Yeah, you also, you can discover through your, you know, failures, some things that you actually really like too. Absolutely. You can make a happy accident. And also I would add to that, um, think about, you know, if, if ingredients match up, if you've got a similar set of spices in one recipe and that's in another recipe, chances are they're going to go well together. You're not going to be competing for things uh, in terms of like flavor profiles aren't going to be competing. And with, you know, with my book, one of the things I really wanted to do is include reci many recipes that use the same ingredients, just right. in a different way. One yeah. thing I absolutely hate is when I buy a book or I look at a recipe and I have to buy X amount of, you know, carrots, Y amount of parsnips, and you know, Z amount of 
turmeric, I don't know. And then I, in the book, there's no other recipe that calls for any of those things. So there's a lot of versatility in, in, in my book specifically, there's a lot of versatility in terms of how you can use the same ingredients in many different ways. There's a lot of coconut milk, there's a lot of mustard, there's a lot of fresh herbs, a lot of spices that keep getting thrown around within the same kind of um, ingredient list, but there's so many approaches to it. So you'll, you'll never get tired of it really. Good, good answers, thanks, that's super helpful. Um, okay, I think I've got time for two more here. So I'm gonna just kind of randomly pick these two. Um, this one from Jan actually generated a great discussion in the chat about herb storage that I ended up actually writing notes on because I have the same issue. It was fantastic. Uh, she says she loves mint, but she has yet to be able to keep it for more than two to three days once she gets it from her farmer's market. Do you guys have any suggestions? She feels like she's tried everything. I've also had this issue with mint. Okay, well, I store it, like I can show you, I store it like this in a mason jar in the fridge, a little bit of water. I put it on my shelf, on uh, one of the fridge shelves, just on the side where it's not too cold. So like on the door or inside the fridge? On the door, on the door. Oh, sorry, okay. on the door. Yeah, a shelf on the door. Um, that's one way to keep it around. You just got to change the water every now and then. Or okay. you, can, you, can wrap, you can wrap it in a paper towel um, and then put it in your crisper drawer. Just don't keep it towards the back of your fridge where it's cold and some frost can build and that's gonna, you know, okay. just ruin it. But Terry, do you have any other tips? You're, you, you always keep a really well-stocked fridge. I definitely do. Mint is not something that I keep a lot of. My feeling is whenever you have too much of anything, give half to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And have them like do that. the same to you, find some cooking buddies. That is actually <laughs> a really great suggestion too. Um, all right, this is going to be our last question. Thank you, everybody. So, um, Terry and Ronnie, for both of you, do you guys ever use Instant Pots? I am yeah. well known for this, that I, that I don't. And it's not that I don't think it's a good idea. It's not um, my mode of cooking. If I was a working mom with kids and I was coming in, you know, I would absolutely do it. But I'm in a working kitchen. I love the magic of the oven. I love seeing that old unfolding process. I'm not a big gadget person, so I don't. During quarantine, I actually thought about getting one. I was like, oh my God, I should maybe embrace it. And I didn't. But Ronnie, what about you? I, I'm on both sides of the fence. I love, there's nothing I love more than something that is braised, right? A braised cut of meat where you take something that's underappreciated, like a, 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 a thick, less coveted cut of something like a, whether it's a brisket or a chuck roast or a pork shoulder, and you just slowly, low and slowly cook that piece of meat or whatever it is, or even vegetables, if you braise vegetables, like fennel. There's nothing I love more than that. On the same side, on the, oh, sorry, on the other side, I also understand that there are people who want that result who don't have the time, obviously, like a busy working mom or a busy parent, um, or somebody that's, you know, in a rush to get meal, meals prepped for work for the week, and they come home really late. So I understand the, the usefulness and practicality of it. The only thing is I've made fantastic food in my Instant Pot. I don't use it as often now because I, I'm, I work from home more. Um, but you don't get the same kind of flavor development in something like a pressure cooker because all of the steam is not allowed to evaporate. And the evaporation is what reduces the sauces and the liquids and concentrates the flavor. So if you're gonna use something like an Instant Pot to make, for example, my short rib ragu, you've gotta promise me that once it's done, you let the sauce simmer to reduce it so you get that similar reduction in concentration and flavor. That's my only caveat. If you're going to use the Instant Pot, you've got to take it another step and reduce whatever you're cooking because it's so full of moisture and liquid and it's going to be diluted. But there are a couple I recipes. Say, like, move it to the stove at that point, put it in, in a pan. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, the beauty of the Instant Pot is the fact that you have a simmer setting. Like you okay. can simmer it and saute or rather the saute setting right in the, in the pot. Okay. Um, sometimes it's a matter of removing whatever you got in there so that the liquid has a chance to evaporate quicker. Um, 
But there are a couple of recipes in the book that would be perfectly suited, in my book, that would be perfectly suited to an instant pot. The braised lamb shank, the cochinita pibil, the uh, short rib ragu, etc. The only caveat, like I mentioned, is please promise me you'll reduce the sauce so it gets nice and rich and delicious. All right. Um, I think that's it, guys. Thank you both so much for spending your Sunday afternoon for us and for all that. That was just a lot of fun. And the discussion especially was fantastic. Um, thank you to everybody who came and is supporting Small Business and Anderson's Bookshop by being here today. Um, once again, the links to order the books are in the chat if you are interested. And we really appreciate you guys just being here and supporting yes. us through this time. And once again, that right there is my um, email address at Anderson's. And I really do, I am looking for feedback as we are building this virtual event landscape from the ground up. Um, we are one of the bigger bookstores for events in the nation. And so there's a few of us who are all trying to figure this out and roll out a plan and program that's sort of similar so that you guys can go to different places and get the same experience. And we would just love your feedback. Um, good, but especially bad, honestly. We need to know it and we wanna be the best we can be like we are with our in-person events. So um, go ahead and shoot me an email if you have um, any feedback, I'd appreciate it. But other than that, Terry and Ronnie, thank you so much for being here. Good luck to you both. Um, and everybody, good luck as we head through the rest of 2020. <laughs> okay, when we're thank you. talking with Ronnie's book, be sure to add Primal Gourmet and hashtag Primal Gourmet so he can join in the fun and find you. All thank right. you, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. And thank you, everybody that's at home that joined us today. Thank you so much. It means the world to us. Uh, and I wish, obviously, I could be there in person with everyone. I know we all do. Maybe yeah. one day, hopefully soon, we can do this in person. It's so fun. Until then, keep cooking. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. There we go.